expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, verse 4, and nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. 4, verse 5, it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And I'll read on a few more verses. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. And I'll stop there. The title of my message is The Great Apostasy. Apostasy is a biblical word that just simply means a turning away from or a falling away from Jesus. The title in my Bible says Description of False Teachers. When we begin to follow false teachers and sometimes we're under deception, we're not even aware of it. We are being deceived, and deception means we're being led astray from the truth of the Bible. That's why you hear me stressing so much that we need to get back to the Scriptures and take the Scriptures seriously. Not to blow it off, not to try to twist it and turn it to make it fit what we are comfortable with, but what God is comfortable with on our behalf. And what God is comfortable with sometimes is not comfortable for us in the natural. Amen? Amen. Sometimes, and we see that in the apostles' lives, the Old Testament uh, prophets. Hey, they suffered for their Lord. They suffered for service to Him. It wasn't a pleasant thing. But they did it anyway because Paul says in another place, they looked beyond this temporary life and they saw eternity, and it's later on in this chapter, by the way. Now, the Spirit expressly or explicitly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. A lot is said in that one verse. We live in that time. And you might be getting tired of that, me saying these things, but it's just true. I would not be a, a good pastor to you if I didn't mention these things. The Spirit expressly says that in the latter days, we're in the latter days. Amen. There's still some of the latter days yet to be fulfilled, but I think that's coming very soon. Very soon. And are we ready? My question is for us. We, we call ourselves believers and followers of Jesus Christ, are we ready to meet him when he calls us in the sky? And then the great tribulation begins to take place, or the tribulation. So the Spirit says, this is the Holy Spirit speaking through the written words of the Apostle Paul. Some will depart from the faith. Not everyone. There are many churches, some independent, some of denominational backgrounds that haven't departed from the faith, they're still teaching the Bible the way it should be taught. And they're not giving in to the cultural changes that are happening and the way that the church in some areas is reinterpreting what the Bible says because they don't like what the Bible says. They don't like to be taught about sin and we need to repent from the sin. We're being taught in some circles that 
Oh, that's too harsh. They, they know they're sinners. It's okay. They'll come around. No, they need to be taught. You, you and I never truly got saved, if we're truly saved, by hearing an easy gospel. Some of us turn out of fear. We didn't want to go to hell. That's okay. I mean, God uses that. Some of us turn because we saw God's grace in the middle of all that. And that even though we might suffer in this temporary realm, still God has purpose for that, for our greater good. He always has purpose in whatever he allows. And he also has purpose in whatever he forbids because that's for our good. I repeat this a lot, but the Ten Commandments are seen sometimes as restrictive to our freedom in our faith. But they're beneficial directives. In other words, the law can't save us, but it can tell us what sin is. And it tells us what the results of sin are if not repented of. So the Ten Commandments are good. They're beneficial to us If we take them seriously, we can't live up to them 100%. Only Jesus did that. Thank God for that. Because it's been fulfilled in him. So you and I don't have to struggle with that. We just know that when we blow it now, as we grow in the Lord, we're more sensitive to our sin against our Lord. And then we we repent. We confess our sin. 1 John 1, 9. And as we do that, we will stay on track. We will not get off the, the way. These false teachers, verse 2, speak lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Boy, that's strong. I don't know much about carterization except that sometimes... Uh, in the past, when they didn't have modern equipment, they, they would use a hot iron or something to, to seal up a wound to keep it from bleeding. They would cauterize the flesh, and they would sear the flesh, and then it would form a scab. That hurt, but it was beneficial. It was healing the wound. But in this case, they cauterized their conscience, which kept them from trusting further in the Lord and speaking lies in hypocrisy. We all kind of know what a hypocrite is or what hypocrisy means. It's being two-faced, portraying ourselves as holy Joes, but yet in our hearts and behind the scenes, we're sinning and excusing our sin without repenting. If that's us, we need to repent of our sins and get back on track with the Lord. Otherwise, we're following the deception of the false teachers who speak lies in hypocrisy. They're false teachers. Having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, hot iron, Forbidding, verse 3, to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. I don't know where some churches get the idea that pastors should not be married or priests. It's certainly not taught in Scripture. The Old Testament priests had wives. Most of them. The Apostle Paul is a great apostle. There's no evidence that he was ever saved, but yet he didn't teach against Peter having a wife. He told us Peter had a wife. So we know some of the apostles of Jesus, his original disciples, were married. So it says here these false teachers are teaching this stuff, forbidding to marry, that it's wrong We can't serve God properly if we're married. And Paul addresses some of those things in in, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where he says sometimes it would be better off if you weren't 
married because then you can give all your efforts and energy to the service of the Lord. But he doesn't forbid marrying. Amen. If he did, he'd be contradicting what he said here. Same guy, wrote the same thing. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods. And you know, God gave a restricted diet to the Jews. Some of it was cultural because they, they didn't have uh, ice to preserve certain meats from decaying. So uh, those meats that would decay rapidly or were eaten by animals that were, were scavengers, they, they eat dead things. And so God prohibited the Jews from eating those things to prevent disease from spreading. But he never meant for it to be a binding thing. And he had to teach Peter a lesson. You remember that? Acts chapter 10. Where God was going to send Peter to a Roman centurion because that Roman needed to know Jesus personally. Because he had a heart for the Jewish people. He showed them kindness. And so God appears to Peter in a dream and he appears to the Roman centurion separately, but God is speaking to both of them that he wants to bring them together. So it's not God just speaking out of the clear blue and somebody getting a revelation of God. Well, I need to go over here to this guy's house and preach salvation to him. But there's no confirmation on the other end. But in this case, there was confirmation on the other Both guys got the message in a different way. Yes. So God had to use the forbidden animals as an example uh, to, for Peter to overcome his prejudice against the non-Jew. Yes. Yeah, there was prejudice in those days. And so... God lowers a sheet with all the forbidden animals. And God tells Peter, Peter, rise up and eat. And it, I always laugh about this because it's sometimes we do this and maybe not in the same way, but we do it. Peter says, no, Lord. Now think that through. What does Lord mean? Especially when it comes to Jesus. He's the boss. Amen. You don't say no to the boss, especially the one that created the universe. But Peter says, no, Lord, you know I'm a good Jew. I'm paraphrasing. I'm a good Jew. I've never eaten anything unclean. And oh, what does God tell him? And we can learn from this in our own culture. Don't you call unclean what I've called clean. So at that point in Peter's history, he's finding out that God had a purpose in calling those unclean in the past, but now he's unveiling that that is still permissible in the present. And that to teach otherwise is a doctrine of demons. I didn't write that. Paul did. Doctrine means teaching. We kind of know what demons are. They're unseen spirits sometimes manifest themselves in a human appearance, but they're not humans. They're fallen angels having great spiritual power. They're demons because they went with Satan in the rebellion in heaven. They got kicked out. But Satan uses the demons to manifest himself through them. There are millions Probably some in this room right now, and I'm not talking about people, I'm talking about invisible spirits. And sometimes he can seem to be omnipresent or everywhere present at the same time, like God is. Except he can't be because he's a created being, he's not God. Amen. You and I are created beings, but we're in Adam and Eve before the fall, the crown of God's creation. Adam and Eve were created perfect and they were innocent of any sin. 
until they sinned. But that distinguishes us humans from the spirit world in this sense that we're made initially in the image and likeness of God. When we come in faith through Jesus Christ and are born again, now we are restored to our Trinitarian being. In other words, in other words body, soul, and spirit. Before true salvation, we're just uh, body and soul. Not unlike anyone else in the world. So we need to take what God has to say about these things seriously. And here he says, if this is taught dogmatically, that means with force and seeming authority, then that is uh, doctrines of demons, the teaching that comes from demons. That can sometimes seem real, like, like it is God speaking to us. Do not underestimate Satan's cleverness. He is really slick. If you can think of the biggest con person you've ever, male or female that you've ever encountered and they're really slick and they probably suckered you in. I, I got both my bank accounts hacked this last week because I was dumb. I didn't take proper precaution. My banks caught it. They finally reissued new numbers. I've got, I'm still settling some of that stuff. But I got conned. I didn't see the warning signs. If it's that easy to con us in the natural realm, how easy it can be for Satan at times to con us in the spiritual realm. When we are unspiritual in our application of the scriptures, we need to take them seriously. It says what it says. And you can't go find some gray area somewhere because I'll tell you what, when you balance the scripture out, it balances out. You begin to cross-reference Old and New Testament and you'll find out, well, I'm, I'm going this direction in my thought process and this is what it seems to say. However, it says this. And so there's balance in that if we take it seriously. This is a chapter of balance. Forbidding to marry, verse 3, and commanding, you know, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. I think most of us here pray over our meals before we take them, whether it's public or private. Should. In public, we shouldn't do it for show like... Look at us. We're real Christians, man. We pray over our meals. And all you heathen are just chowing down. That's not to be the attitude. It should be just humbly thanking the Lord for his provision. And then chowing down. No restrictions. For every creature, verse 4, of God is good... And nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. For, check this out. I didn't write this. Verse 5. For it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Amen. Sanctified means it's set apart. It's set apart for our use. That's what sanctified means. It's basic meaning. When we first got saved, when we were born again, the heaven... And heaven looked at us and set us apart unto God. We, we were called out of our old ways into the presence of God. And now we're being changed as we grow in Jesus. We're sanctified. We're set apart once. Oh, you know another word for sanctified? We're saints. Amen. You know, some denominations claim that certain individuals only are saints. But the Bible says that everybody's a true believer is a saint. Amen. You know that? 
We don't care. It doesn't care. The, the writers of Scripture don't care whether it's a priest, a prophet, a poet, a farmer, or a street person that got saved. We're all saved. We're all set apart by God, by His own will. Yeah, for a purpose that we are then continually being changed from one stage of growth spiritually to another. The only way we can be ongoingly sanctified is to be in our word and to study it in proper context and not try to shift it for our own desires. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it's created with thanksgiving. Not so, Lord, Peter says. God says, Peter, don't you call unclean what I've called clean. For it is sanctified, set apart by the word of God in prayer. Verse 5, moving on, verse 6. Remember, these Timothy letters and Titus are what we call pastoral letters. Young Timothy is a young pastor, and Paul is signing to the church at Ephesus. Big deal, man. That was a hard one. And Timothy is young in the Lord, but he was pretty mature because he's raised by Christian grandmother and mother. And then along comes the Apostle Paul and nurtured him and helped him grow up in the faith to where now he is qualified to be a pastor. So Paul says, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. Another word for doctrine is wholesome teaching. In this case, it comes from a different Greek word, but good means good because it's from God. It's not good like sometimes we interpret good, something that feels good to us. Good doctrine sometimes is doctrine that we need a spanking from. That's good for us. We don't like it. It says in Hebrews, that while it's happening, especially the, the more severe spankings we get, that it's not pleasant. It says that in Hebrews 12, I think it is. It's not pleasant for the time being. But I'm paraphrasing that, but it's good for us. But reject, verse 7, profane and old wise fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. There were a lot of fables and myths that was a Greek and Roman world and if you've looked into Greek mythology at all you, you can see the craziness that came through that. Those gods and goddesses were a whole lot like human beings. They got jealous of one another. They killed off their opponents. Those are gods and goddesses of the Greek and Roman culture. A whole lot like humans. Why is that? Because the human concoction is after their own mind. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Bodily exercise profits a little. At Murrieta Hot Springs Conference Center, when before there was a big change at Costa Mesa, we went to most of our conferences there. Beautiful place. And um, they also had the Bible school on the same campus. And so they had a weight room for those that like to work out bodily exercise. So the director, Jeff Dorman at the time, uh, got to know him pretty well, but uh, he put a sign over the door to the weight room, profits a little. <laughs> because those guys, and women too, those guys that were really into the bodybuilding, and you know, it's interesting about that. See, I can address this because I'm jealous. <laughs> I've never had a great body. What you see is, no, I was skinny one time. I, I was. You can laugh now. That's okay. I know. 
I'm the way I look now because I didn't eat foods that were conducive to good shape, but I do have a shape. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So I was never into that. Even when I was on the wrestling team, I hated lifting weights, but I did because it was mandatory. It was good for me in, in that setting. But to make it a belief system where now you begin to look down on other people because they're not doing that, now it becomes a religion. It really does. If that's not true, why are there mirrors all over in that joint? Amen. And especially the guys, you know. They, they work out a little bit and they go, they're flexing in front of the mirror. You know. Check that muscle out, man. I see, I'm jealous, you know, because I don't have those muscles. But do you understand what I'm saying here and what the scripture is telling us? Not to make a, a, a demand of that, but to take it for what it is. It profits a little bit. It does. It's good for us to a degree. But what does it say in this verse? For bodily exercise profits a little. There's an admission there by the Holy Spirit. But godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So godly living, being a godly person, godly in our behavior, in our thinking, in our speech, and we know we're not 100%, but we can be a whole lot more godly than we are, right? Amen, amen. Have a long way to go. The promise of the life that now is, that's now, godliness is good for us now amen. and for that which is to come. So it goes beyond the natural. It goes beyond the biceps, man. I don't know what our bodies are going to be like in the eternity, but we're going to get new ones. I'm going to guess that we don't need mirrors <laughs> to show our bodies off to ourselves and to others in the room. Now, that's my guess. It's not doctrine. You don't have to accept it as doctrine. Verse 9, though, says this. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. When I was an elder at the church in Hesperia, Dennis Davenport was the church of Calvary Chapel of the High Desert in Hesperia. And he had one guy that was really buffed. Short guy, but he was really buffed. Good looking guy, you know. And he was really into the bodybuilding, but he was an elder. And so he qualified to be an elder in that church. You had to be a teaching elder, so you had to be familiar with the Word of God. But he told me, he says, I wish that so-and-so would be as diligent in his study of the Bible as he is of building his body. You know, that, that troubled our pastor. And our pastor was in good shape. You know, he stayed in good shape. But he didn't make it a, a religion. For this they say in verse 10, we both labor and suffer reproach. Oh, that hurts. Because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. He's the Savior of all men, comma, but especially of those who believe. Christ died for everybody, but not everybody will get saved. He died especially for those who would believe. So, Salvation is open to everybody, even those that might be coming to church regularly that have yet to truly give in to the Lord. Might be somebody this morning. If that's true of you and the Holy Spirit's working in your heart, just give in. Just turn to the Lord and confess your sins. Say, I just want you to come in and clean me out, Lord. Who's the Savior of all men, that's God's will, that all be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's will. 
But God also knows, and he puts it down in Scripture for us, that not everybody will believe. As we study through Isaiah on Wednesday nights, the first portion of Isaiah is largely words of condemnation against Israel and other nations. It can be pretty tedious, man. You know, God's whacking on them all the time, sending these foreign governments against them, overthrowing them and killing them off, putting them into captivity. But to God's chosen nation, how do you figure that? He wants all of them to be saved, but he acknowledges in Scripture that not all will be saved. There's a verse in chapter 11 of Romans where it can be interpreted that way that all Israel will be saved because he says it that way in that chapter. There's going to be a point when all Israel is saved. But when you read the balance of Scripture, you find out that the all Israel that will be saved is the remnant. That little bitty portion of Israel that will truly get saved, not all of it. Not every Israelite that ever lived, ever lived. And we go back and we see that in Noah's flood. Of course, that's before uh, Abraham and, and brought Judaism on the scene. But nevertheless, only eight people survived that flood and millions, billions probably died. Amen. They probably went to hell. I, you know, I can't say that dogmatically, but I'm going to guess that. It was a judgment. God pouring out his judgment on an unbelieving world. Only eight, eight people survived. And so some people reject Christianity as we teach it because he's too harsh. That's a meanie God. I don't want to have anything. You know, we, we, we had a nurse in emergency in L.A. when Jolene was still alive and we took her down there. And uh, he was really good, a sharp guy. But he was a Buddhist. And we always try to witness to people, especially my wife, if you knew her, you knew that. He says, I, I don't want to have anything to do with a religion that condemns you. So he's Buddhist. And if you study Buddhism at all, there's somewhere in there is a dead end street. Perfection is nirvana kind of their concept of heaven. But that's when you become nothing. Isn't that slick? Their desire is just nothingness. Now that's pretty close to Christianity in a way, isn't it? We sing this song over communion. Lord, help me come to the end of myself that all that is left is you. And I believe that. I believe that. But it's not nirvana where we just become nothing. Because we're something in God's sight, even if we're a Buddhist. I'm going to tell you that. Jolene tried that once. She tried a lot of stuff in her hippie days. Scientology, Zen Buddhism. She had a Gohunson in her apartment. And she would chant to that Gohunson, whatever was inside there, you know. And she, she could even do the, the chant words now, you know, after the fact. She did it so often, you know. So she would chant to the Gohansen. And it was nothing. It was nothingness. So that's an empty, quote, religion. And so can Christianity be empty if we don't empty ourselves out of willingly those false teachings that we bought into. Chapter, uh, verse, verse 11 of chapter 4. Verse 11, he's still instructing Timothy. These things command and teach. See, Paul is saying, this is not lightweight stuff that I'm teaching here. This is heavy duty stuff. These things command and teach. Continue to teach them. It's healthy stuff. Let no one despise your youth, verse 12, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, 
in spirit, in faith, and purity. Wow. You know, some of these verses are just packed with meaning, aren't they not? Just that one verse. No one despise your youth. You know, Paul said early on, last chapter, the qualifications for an elder or deacon is one not to be a novice, not to be a brand new Christian because he's not grounded yet in the scriptures. He, he's, he, he's not stabilized yet. So you don't appoint them that office. Wait till they grow. Well, Timothy had grown. He, he had a godly grandmother and mother that taught him the necessary things. And then Paul comes along and just kind of completes that action in his life. So he's trustworthy. But Paul's also practical. He knows that the old timers in the church are going to see this young whippersnapper come in and he becomes the senior pastor. And some of the elders that have been there for a while and they were appointed by Paul to be an, an elder in that church, not as a senior pastor, but an elder. And here comes whippersnapper. And who's this pipsqueak kid that's just been saved a few years? Who, who's he to be a ruler over this church? So Paul says, don't let anybody despise your youth. He may be young in terms of age, but he was mature spiritually and qualified as a result of that. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers. And here are examples of spiritual growth and stability. Be an example to the believers in word. Stick to the word. Don't vary from it. In conduct, the qualifications for an elder, you go back to the last chapter, you see that our conduct is supposed to be approved by not only one another in the church, but also in the community we live in, that we ought to have a good reputation with the non-believer out there. Amen. And not have the attitude, ah, they're a bunch of heathen, what do, what do we care what they think? How are we going to win them if we have that attitude? Be an example of the believers in word, in conduct, in love. If we have an attitude against them, that's not love. In spirit. Being motivated by the Holy Spirit in faith. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. The guys worked really hard to wire me up properly so you have good hearing out there, but then things like this happen, so excuse me. In faith, in purity, holy living, pure living, not giving in to the things of this world that are unholy. Till I come, verse 13, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Reading the scripture, sometimes not just simply studying it, but reading it. The one year Bible is a good thing. Uh, you could study it, you know, you could study from it, but it's also just a good reading. Sometimes we'll pick up things just reading. And we might have forgot everything we read prior to something that stands out to us. But then it's beneficial. Amen? Amen. And it's God's will. To exhortation, that's to urge others to build them up in the faith, to help one another. To doctrine, again, teaching teaching the overall scripture and how it applies in given situations. Do not neglect, verse 14, the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. And they practiced that a lot in those early days and it's still in churches today, we practice the laying on of the hands. Very often in our churches, somebody says, I'm sick, call for the elders of the church and well, anoint him with oil and lay hands on him and pray for, pray for their problem. And so we, we do that, but 
another denomination I served in, uh, I, I was attending an ordination service for pastors. And the, uh, the elder body that came out of district to that conference, uh, there were several men, and they laid hands on each of those pastoral candidates, and they prayed for them and prayed for God's anointing as they go into the ministry. I, I like that. So that's another example on the lay, of the laying on of hands. Meditate, verse 15, on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Progress, spiritual growth. People can see it. You're maturing. You're getting better and better. And he's already equipped to do that. But Paul's encouraging him. Continue on in what you're doing. Don't back off. Continue on being fervent in the love of the Lord and for people. Take heed to yourself, verse 16, and to the doctrine. Boy, I, I haven't counted how many times he said doctrine in these 16 verses. Pretty important, don't you think? Take heed to yourself. Make sure you're walking in step. Pastor, continue in them. You see, the title of my message to begin with today is the apostasy. Apostasy means a turning away from the faith, a turning away from Jesus Christ, a turning away from the truth of the Scripture. That's what apostasy is. And that's a characteristic of the last days. We are living in an era of, in America, I never thought we'd see it this way. Some of us said are older, we never thought we'd see what we're seeing now. The apostasy. The turning away. Continue in them. Don't turn away from them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Think about that. One more verse. I think it's 2 Timothy, real quick, as we wind up this teaching because it's comparative. But by the way, Paul has a lot more to say in, 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 the, in 2 Timothy as well. Oh yeah, here it is, chapter 3, coming of apostasy. So it's almost identical to what we just read. Apostasy means a turning away from or leaving the faith. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, verse 1, chapter 3, 2 Timothy. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, <laughs> boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. These are characteristics of the last days. Unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutals, despisers of good. Check your newspapers, check your newscasts. What's going on in our world? In America, it's supposed to be a godly nation. Our leaders on both sides running for president and offices, they're all saying, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're true Americans. We believe in God. And then they do some most ungodly things that go against what the scriptures actually teach. Examples of the last days and the apostasy that will occur during those last days. Traitors, verse 4, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And boy, is that not true of our culture. When you study the history of the Greeks and Romans, you don't have to do a lot of studying to see how corrupt they were. But man, you can see a lot of the practices in our own culture and our own society that reflect that mentality. Just does. I gotta be careful with my phone or my computer, so do you. And so do you need to monitor your kids, what they're watching on their phone. I'm gonna tell you that. There's stuff out there that is so subtle, it'll grab those kids and lock them in their attention, 
And there might be teaching there that's totally opposite to the scriptures. And that's in a Christian home, by the way. Traitors, headstrong, haughty lovers of pleasure, lovers, lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. Sometimes there's a form of religion in there. But denying its power. And from such people turn away. So it's telling you and I in the church to turn away from them. Not to abandon them because we need to witness to them. But we don't hang out with them and do what they do. I say this often. I'm a former alcoholic. When I got saved and genuinely saved, God delivered me from alcoholism. So I quit hanging out with my old buddies. For a while I didn't, but then after a while they wouldn't invite me over anymore. Because I want to talk about Jesus. And I didn't do it in a forceful way. I just, you know, it was just a natural part of me then. From such people turn away... For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of the gullible women loaded down with sins led away by various lusts. Oh, Paul's pecking on women again. Paul is a male chauvinist. The feminist, the Christian feminist, I say that, it's kind of tongue in cheek. Paul was a chauvinist, anti-women. No, he wasn't. He was just telling the truth. That's not to say that men aren't weighed down with all those things either. But very often, women can be more susceptible. Oh, you're a male chauvinist, Pastor. I don't know if I can come to this church anymore. By that definition, maybe I am. But I'm not. There's a balance. There's a balance here that we need to learn. It's going to take a while. He was deceived, not Adam. Which means, in that case... If you ladies are a little upset at God and the way he puts things down about women, the man was more guilty than the woman of sinning. You know that? Adam was created before Eve, and he was given the only commandment that was in existence before she arrived on the scene. So it was his responsibility to teach her. Apparently he didn't because she bought Satan's lie and then turned to him and the guy was with her when that temptation went down. He was violating his headship responsibility to protect his wife spiritually and physically and let that snake deceive her. And then she turned and gave him the fruit, whatever it is. And he ate. He wasn't deceived. He sinned willingly. So it's on the guy as much or more than it is on the women. So understand that. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There are people like that. I, you know, I've said this before. I went, I went to another denomination and we were there five years, and this woman had been in that denomination, and it was a Bible-teaching church, for 30-some years and never got saved till just within a year when we arrived there. She's in church, a Bible-teaching church, for 30 years and never got saved. Somehow it didn't sink in. But God wants to change us. Uh, I wanted to see something. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll stop with these two verses at the end of this chapter. Very important. Uh, verse 15, he's speaking to Timothy, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise. 
for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He's talking about his grandmother and his mother that raised him in the Christian atmosphere. So that's a tribute to women. All scripture, verse 16, listen carefully. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof, for correction. Oh, we don't like that one. For instruction in righteousness. Verse 17, that the man of God, and that means woman also, please, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's strong stuff. Paul says that in this letter. He says it another way in one of the other letters. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Peter says, it came through holy men of God. You know, and I worked with guys at the railroad, and I'm sure you have too. And they, ah, the Bible's written by just a bunch of men. Well, we can agree in part with that. Largely as men who wrote the Bible. But not just a bunch of men. Not just a bunch of bozos. Not just a bunch of holier than thou's hypocrites. Holy men of God who wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit where God the Holy Spirit literally breathed into them his words. They were the givers of the word, but it wasn't out of their own intellect. It was as the Holy Spirit moved on their heart and moved through them to give the message. So it's not just a bunch of bozos, not just a bunch of holy than thou. It's not that at all. Godly men, when you study the history of how the Bible came about, and if you're honest with it, my, my opinion is this, if you're honest with it, I don't know how you can doubt the authenticity of the scriptures. Amen. That the Bible itself is the real thing, man. It took 15, 15 to 1600 years time period for the Bible to be completed. Think it's through. That goes over different cultures, different continents, and it, Sometimes kings wrote scripture, sometimes prophets, sometimes farmers. So a whole range of different occupations, if you will, were involved in the, the giving of the Bible. God trusted people from those various cultural backgrounds to write his scripture as they gave up to him and he moved by his spirit in and through them. And we got the accurate word of God. Huh? No contradictions. No contradictions. There may be seeming contradiction. This is my opinion. Yes. Seems like a contradiction, but if you read far enough and you compare it with other scriptures, you'll find out in proper context, there's not really a contradiction if you're honest. Amen. Just isn't. Seems like it. To our natural way of thinking, apart from the Holy Spirit, yeah, it sounds contradictory. The Bible's tough, man. It's not an easy study. It takes a lot of years to really begin to grasp it for it to change our lives and mature us to where we truly look like Christians. Like he told Timothy. Father, we thank you for your holy scriptures. As it says here, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thank you, Lord, for providing everything we need to grow and to eventually graduate when Jesus comes to call us home. We look forward to that day. We ask your blessings on us, but most of all, that we have blessed you by our attention to your word, Lord. And may it continually begin to change us from one stage of spiritual growth to the next.
because that's our desire and we know it's yours, Father. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing this last song together.